This is the State of Things broadcasting from the American Tobacco Historic District. I'm Frank Stacio. Military veterans often notice the way their stories are reduced to a simple narrative. A wounded warrior, for example, or a caregiver forced into combat. But my guests today argue there is no one story about those who serve. Through fiction, poetry, and art, they implore you to look deeper and see veterans in all their human complexity. Jerry Bell is a former Navy officer and co-author of the book, It's My Country Too, Women's Military Stories from the American Revolution to Afghanistan. And she joins me now. Jerry, welcome to State of Things. Thanks for having me, Frank. Also with us is L.J. Bowens, an Army veteran and author and spoken word artist. L.J., welcome to you. Hey, how you doing? Very well, thank you. David Jay is with us, an award-winning photographer whose exhibit, The Unknown Soldier, opens this evening in Duke University's Frederick Jameson Gallery. David, welcome to you. Hello, and thank you for having me. Jerry, I want to start with you, and I want to ask you about your book, this book about the stories we don't know, women in the military from, from the American Revolution through Afghanistan. Why did you write this book? In 2013, I started working with the Veterans Writing Project, which is a D.C.-based nonprofit that offers no-cost writing workshops to veterans and their family members, and we also publish their work. We had noticed in the writing seminars that were co-ed that women veterans were not speaking up as much as the men, as much as even the women family members. And so our director, Ron Capps, asked me to put together a course specifically for women veterans uh, to give them a a safer space to tell their stories. I started looking for writing examples by women veterans, and about that time, uh, early 2014, a civilian novelist, Kara Hoffman, who wrote a novel, wonderful novel called um, Be Safe, I Love You, published an op-ed called The Things She Carried in the New York Times, and she pointed out that women veterans' stories were not a part of our culture. The implication, whatever her intent was, what that felt like was um, that women veterans weren't writing, and that wasn't true. Uh, Kayla Williams, an Arabic linguist who wrote one of the first memoirs to come out of the current war in Iraq, um, the the memoir, uh, Love My Rifle More Than You, responded in the Los Angeles Review of Books with a short bibliography. I launched from that, started looking, and found hundreds of military women's stories. And in 20 years in the military, I didn't know any of them, and it kind of made me mad. Well, I'd like to hear at least a few of them now because you have us intrigued and and do take (laughs) us back to the American Revolution. Sure. So uh, American women have been uh, dressed, well, early before they were um, officially enlisting in the armed forces, were cross-dressing as men. And serving in the infantry. And there was a woman named Deborah Sampson, later Gannett. She dressed as a man, joined the infantry, participated in several battles, was wounded, and was discovered after she caught a fever in Philadelphia. The doctor found that she was a woman. After the war, she wrote a co-wrote with a publisher in New Hampshire who altered her story to make it more interesting, he thought. Uh, she wrote her memoir and published it and then revised it slightly as a lecture and took it on the lecture circuit in 1802, being the first American woman to do that. She would come out on the stage when she had someone to call the rifle commands, and she would uh, be in her uniform, and she would do rifle drill with those heavy rifles. And uh, she did that uh, to make money and also to try to explain her side of the story, why she violated conventional rules for women to go fight. Now, the unique thing about her story then and when she's on stage is that it's a kind of, it's an oddity, right? Wow, come see the woman who dressed as a man to serve. Fast forward to Afghanistan and even your service, it's not so unusual to serve, but even you found it difficult to write about women in the voice of a woman while you were still in uniform. Yes, that's true. I started graduate school at Johns Hopkins University uh, in 2005, three years before I retired from active duty. And as many students in a writing program do, I thought I was writing the great Navy novel, which is, thank God, in the trash can now. But it was (laughs) written from the point of view of a young man who enlisted. And my fiction advisor kept saying, you really ought to write these stories from the point of view of a woman. And I got angry at first and said, well, I should be able to write both. He said, not that, it's the theme. 
this theme would be much more interesting explored from the point of view of a woman. And I said, oh, my God, we never do that. Women on Mm. active duty do not tell our stories. We don't talk about how it really is, because if we did, it would just make it worse for all women serving. And at the time, I believed that. I no longer believe it, but at that time I did. So it kind of explained why so few women were telling their stories when you noticed that as as a writing instructor, right? That absolutely. And going back through the history, we found that particularly the generation of women who served in World War II, most did not tell their stories. Um, They were shunned by society because nice girls didn't join the armed forces. And it was only around the 1990s when the 50th anniversary of um, Victory in Europe was coming up Mm -hmm. that family members said, Grandma, you've got to tell these stories. You've got to put them down. So there were some little vanity presses that published some short memoirs, uh, some very uh, uh, short pieces done in magazines and newspapers and things. And that was when that generation started speaking up. LJ, let me ask you about getting started in in poetry and spoken word. You did that while you were in the Army, did you? Um, Yes. Well, I I originally started doing spoken word many, many, many moves ago (laughs) as uh, as a 10th grader in high school, but I kind of got away from it once I joined the military. It wasn't until I met my chief warrant officer by the name of Keith Johnson, and he came out with a self-published poetry book called Moments, Short Stories, and Poems, and he came across some of my writing on social media back when social media and the internet was starting to get the big boom. I believe it was MySpace, was it (laughs) MySpace, yes. Okay, there we go. (laughs) MySpace, good old MySpace. (laughs) And he said, you know what, maybe you should go ahead and try and publish your poems, put some poems out. And at first I really wasn't gearing towards it because poetry has always been a good love. But I didn't know if it was something I wanted to do because most of the time when you start writing, you always look at more of these things as a hobby as instead of people telling you, hey, you should go out and try and do this. Or maybe with your poems, you could be put on this certain platform. Because one, plat- one of the big platforms that was out during that time was Deaf Poetry Jam on HBO. Right. So when it was getting close to us coming back from a deployment, I decided to go ahead publish a poetry book and pretty much went from that point. And from there, I kind of really was more so into being just the author, but it wasn't until I went to an open mic event where I started getting more of appreciation for spoken word and the dynamics of spoken word as it deals with poetry, because they're, they're almost one of the same. The only difference is you're adding a little bit more dramatics and theater to doing your poems and, it kind of elevated from there as far as the work that I do currently now. But it's going to come out of your personal experience. And I wonder if you felt the way Jerry did while you were in uniform about expressing yourself and your situation in the military while you were there. Through I, actually, I actually did. Um, it really started when in our deployment. So there was an open mic that was going on in our deployment. We were in LSA Anaconda, Balad Air Force Base, and they started up doing open mics there while we were deployed. It was an outlet as far as getting soldiers out there instead of worrying so much about what's going on in the war. But when I went there, I really didn't want to, i say, sign up for the open mic list. And the only reason because they were basically going off a theme of a movie called Love Jones. But this movie Love Jones is basically about a a writer that was big in the poetry scene. A woman steps up and comes to the poetry scene and they fall in love. But a lot of the poems during that time were love poems in that movie. So the whole theme of that was, we're just going to go ahead and do an open mic for love poems Mm -hmm. and that's it. And I didn't really, I I get it, but I didn't appreciate it because I'm like, we need to talk about more than just love. I mean, there's a lot more with poetry. Even if you look at the, the grand scheme of things when poetry started, there was poems that was broken down into so many different facades of life. And we should just stay to that because um, even after a um, conversation we were having earlier before stepping in here, um, when you see things in a one dimensional mindset, you only stick to that one thing where there's a bigger platform and plateau of us to cross, especially as artists, we should cross those plateaus and break those barriers. I want to talk more about that and the barriers that you hope to break and what this means to you personally uh, as you process your service in the military through your art. Uh, David J., I want to ask you about your new exhibit, Unknown Soldier, and you present veterans with very visible wounds, and, and I can say it can be disturbing for people to look at these. We've got links at our website. But what do you hope that people are going to get from this? What, what do you hope uh, will happen to people who see your exhibit? Yeah, well, I think it's important first to understand that the Unknown Soldier series, which is a series of uh, 
approximately 15 or 16 large format images of, as you said, severely wounded um, soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan is actually part of a much larger series that's been 15 years in the making, which incorporates um, another series called The Scar Project and another one called The Alabama Project, uh, another one called Grief Camp. And uh, when uh, what we were just talking about as well were these... Uh, Sometimes I'm concerned where a, uh, the unknown soldier perhaps is presented in a very narrow uh, focus, and then it appears to be just about veterans or just about war. And in fact, it is not. You ask what I hope that people see there. I think I hope that people see, um, perhaps ask themselves what part they play. Where do they stand in all this? Are we creators of all this? Are we just watching it go by? Uh, are we as if we're spectators? Because we are not. These things, war, veterans, they don't just happen on their own. We create them, all of us, through our the most innocuous little uh, interactions, our day-to-day -day interactions with each other, create the future. They, they really do. They, they the way we treat each other, the way the compassion we have for each other, the understanding, the recognition of how similar we are as human beings. Um, I hope that uh, increases our understanding of one another and leads away from war so that I don't have to do another series like this in the near future or ever. It's interesting to think that uh, we've talked to, to when I talked to Dar, uh, Jerry and LJ, of course, they are veterans. You're not a veteran. All three of you are artists in your own way. David, what what do you uh, how do you approach this when you're telling the story, essentially somebody else's story? Yeah, I actually try not to tell their story for them. I really, as a photographer, at least personally, I although I have quite a strong style, a personal style, I really try to get out of the way um, of the of the subject. I just try to take a very very honest picture of the person sitting in front of me, and in fact, all I ever tell them is just look at me. Just look at me. I keep repeating it. And I think I just want them to look at me as they would look at their friend or uh, or you sitting across the table with a very honest look. And I, I, I guess I'm trying to capture a soul. I, the outside is not so important to me. The feeling that one gets when you look at the pictures, there's an immediate connection with them. And I think people, you almost end up behind their eyes. You end up being them for a moment and you get to feel what they feel. And I that kind of understanding and compassion is what I'm trying to kind of create and just this kind of awareness of what we do. Jerry, David makes a good case for why all of us should participate in this art and understand it and, and come at it and, and appreciate what's being produced. For you as the artist and veteran, what, what do you get from, you talked about the importance of helping women write their story and tell their story. Why is that even important? I feel like it's uh, it's important because our stories as women have been misrepresented over the years uh, and misunderstood. Tracy and I discovered in the process of researching the historical context for the women's writing that we put into It's My Country Too, three what I would call myths about women's service that had been told to us from the beginning. The first one was that women had only ever served in support roles, nurses, cooks, um, intelligence, communications. And we found that that wasn't true. Women had been picking up guns and shooting from the beginning and have done so in pretty much every major cons uh, conflict, either picking up guns and shooting or being right at the front lines in support roles since the American Revolution, with the exception of the Spanish-American War. The second myth, and I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody had said this to me, is that women's integration into the armed forces was imposed from the outside by a bunch of feminazis. Um, and we found that that wasn't true at all. Military women were the ones raising their hands. I told Dakowitz before Desert Storm, we need to be in combat. We need to be right there with the men. We were always the ones saying we can do more. And this was not something imposed. We were pushing open the door, a little crack here, a little crack there, break the law and go into a combat zone where you're not supposed to be. The third myth that we found was that men had allowed us to integrate into the armed forces. The establishment of women's active components in 1948 was the brainchild of two women, Edith North Smith, who had been with the Red Cross in World War I, and um, Margaret Chase Smith of Maine, a senator, who started out 
uh, on subcommittees dealing with defense, after writing the legislation that integrated women into the armed forces as a regular component, she put her money where her mouth was and commissioned into the Air Force as a lieutenant colonel and served in the Air Force Reserves for eight years. So these are all reasons why we should both do the writing and read the writing, right, and, and be engaged in this conversation through art. LJ, let me ask you in what ways you think the narrative has been simplified, that we sort of understand uh, military service if we haven't served ourselves or if we've been out for a while in very simple siloed narratives. I think with, I think with that, and that's actually a very good question, I think most of us, it, it goes so far back. We were just talking about this. So if you take it so far back to like the storytellers of, of old, you normally hear these stories of old, which are stories that get passed down from one generation to the next. And now as it deals with the veteran story, the, the military story, you have all these stories that are happening, whether it's, whether through spoken word, whether it's through photography, whether it's through some avenue. And I think that the, the narrative became simplified because it's now more veterans. And there's a lot of veterans that a lot of people don't know. They're actually in the arts now that's portraying these stories and doing certain things are crossing over. Perfect example to what you're saying, like somebody that wasn't in the military, but shared the story. There's a R&B artist by the name of Trey Songz. He did this video. I can't remember the name of the song, but there's a video where he took the army narrative of, of a woman that he was married to. Now the song deals with breakup, but the video approach he took to it was, was a woman that he was married to that was serving in the military and she ended up getting deployed. And then there's a scene where she's running the front line, helping out every, um, helping out her fellow battle buddies and soldiers. And then, uh, IED comes up and she perishes because of it. He gets the phone call and he's basically telling the story of her standpoint of what she did in the military, why she served mm -hmm. and the sacrifice of what she did, not only for her country, but for their situation, their, their marriage and everything. And it's one of those things where I think that more people do understand. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely something that, um, I definitely appreciate, especially if it's not me, if it's not coming from my side or her side or anybody else's, we have people like David that are doing these, um, exhibits to, having the pictures speak for themselves of the veterans and what they go through, especially on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they've been injured or they're just trying to make it by. And Jerry, I wonder to what extent, you know, we, we all suffer and are somewhat uh, bereft of, of the, our understanding when we understand things in such a simple way. But I wonder to what extent women in the military, to take one example, have internalized this and understand their own experience that way because that's the narrative. I think that we women in the military do to some extent internalize that narrative. We don't we don't see ourselves in history. We're given in accession training, whether it's at the service academies, ROTC, uh, boot camp. We're given for the Navy stories of Admiral Halsey and Admiral Admiral Nimitz, Chesty Puller for the Marines. And I'm sorry, I just don't see myself in Chesty Puller. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And so. I think that because we don't see ourselves in these historical heroes, uh, we don't set our sights as high. We don't, or fewer of us set our sights as high. I think I might have worked a whole lot harder on shiny shoes and physical training if I had known about the women who were mm -hmm. prisoners of war in World War II for three and a half years, Army and Navy nurses who almost starved to death in a Japanese prison camp. You know, if I had been able to see myself in some of those stories, um, I, I might have made more of a difference in my time. In David J., how did your ideas uh, open up and expand as as the artist who began with a project, understanding that things were more, more complex, and yet through the process, did you did your eyes opened as well? Oh, completely. I I often think I came in uh, when I began shooting these things. I thought I knew what the pictures meant. But it didn't take long before I realized, oh, I only know a fraction of what the pictures mean. I started getting these, this is going back 15 years now, and over those 15 years, I've received literally tens of thousands of emails from around the world with the most beautiful messages and things from, from positions that had never even occurred to me. People who felt they had been really helped by seeing the images, people that had kind of reclaimed their uh, their their self-worth and even felt where their beauty, they could reclaim their beauty by seeing these pictures, even though the pictures are not beautiful, but in the pictures you do see beauty. You see the beauty of just a human being, a soul, and they recognize th that we're all that person. And, and that was so gratifying and fulfilling to have all this come back in directions that I had never expected.
David Jay is an award-winning photographer whose exhibit, The Unknown Soldier, opens tonight at Duke University. Also spoke with Jerry Bell, former naval officer and co-author of It's My Country Too, Women's Military Stories from the American Revolution to Afghanistan. And L.J. Bowens, an Army veteran and author and spoken word artist. And they will be on a panel together. And I want to thank you all for being on the program. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just ahead, the poetry that breaks the rules of gender. Stay tuned.